natural glow, I'd been demonstrating that in the malls. Uh, and when it came time to put it on TV and I had to cut it down, as I could only cut it down to two minutes. And I thought to myself, I've, I need to get all this information out in order to sell it. So it became sort of the longest commercial at that time. Everybody was like, oh my God, this ad's so long, it's two minutes. Uh, but of course then it wasn't the longest commercial ever because after the two minute, the, we then went on and started doing 30 minute adverts. Um, so, uh, and I liked it. I like resourcing, uh, you know, sourcing products. Trying to find out what people want and what's lacking in people's lives and how I could, you know, then get that made and sell it to them. And I like trying to figure out what are the things that I could say about a product that would make people want to buy it while still keeping the honesty, you know, and integrity, you know, sort of of me and the product. Um, and it just took off. I, I really, um, although I didn't expect to become famous from the adverts, I don't know why that didn't occur to me. Because people in England, they didn't, they weren't famous for adverts. There was just adverts on all the time, willy nilly, and I just expected, you know, that would be it. But for some reason, it just they just seemed to take the country by storm. Who's this mad woman with the horrible voice, and what's she all about? There was a lot of TV shows on at the time. I can't remember they, what they were called, but they always used to take the mickey out of me. You know what I mean? And every week somebody used to dress up in a suit and put the hair in a French pleat and try and do my accent on the telly. Uh, and I still get people now, I had a drag queen yesterday sent me an email saying the very first time they ever dressed up as a woman in drag, they dressed up as me. Um, for a school project and they dressed up as me and, and, and did, um, yes, <laughs> an infomercial. Neil Roberts was made head of TVNZ, so I went to see him. And between us, we came up with the idea of guess who's coming to dinner. Uh, so I'd wanted to go to women and give them a makeover and give them a sort of a, a special day. Uh, uh, and it was quite a good process in those days. We all sat round a table and we had the big whiteboard and, and it, that's how it came about. Why don't you go there and you go there that and they don't know you're coming and all this, that and the other. And we ended up with uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, which was fabulous which I absolutely loved. I auditioned um, men for the role of my driver and eventually uh, Anthony Ray Parker became yeah, the driver that took me everywhere and became sort of my offsider. Uh, and we had that show going, I think it was about five years, I don't know. But unfortunately, with New Zealand being so small, we really ran out of celebrities in the end. Uh, by the end, I'd had every All Black, every cricketer, everybody off Shortland Street, every netballer, and we were sort of, you know, ah, who can we put on it now? That was Greenstone's idea. Uh, I, at that stage, didn't know what a garage sale was. Like most British people, I thought they were selling garages, as you do, and so... They really had to explain the concept to me. Um, so that worked quite well. And again, Anthony Ray came on board for that. So that was basically getting up at the crack of dawn, going to these garage sale, which is basically where people just sell off all their own old, old junk, don't they, that they don't want. Uh, so we would buy all the old junk and our mission was to buy enough stuff to make over one complete room in someone's house. Uh, so we were dashing all over town to various garage sales. Then we would take all the stuff back to the house uh, where somebody would help us dress the room. And then it was a surprise for the people sort of when they came home. When I originally went for the audition, I thought that maybe I was too flippant for it because everybody seemed to be giving, <coughs> excuse me, uh, very sensible answers, you know what I mean? Like, oh, I think you should see a psychologist or a psychologist, you know, and psychiatrist and, and get some therapy and it was all this. And I was just like, oh my God, just have a cup of tea, love, and have a word with yourself and tell him to bugger off and, you know, you don't need him. And I thought, um, they're never going to pick me for this because I thought I was too, a bit too humorous for it. Uh, but they did. I really enjoyed that, 5.30 every night. And, um, it, but it was actually quite um, upsetting to realise how many people had such, so many problems, especially to children and teenagers. In fact, in the end, we had to bring on somebody, a young fella, especially to deal with 
the, the kids that used to write in and, and or, or with their problems. Um, but I think I did help people from that. I was trying to, you know, get people to lighten up a little bit and not be so serious about life. It was so hard. I think it was one of the hardest, hardest things I have ever, ever done. Uh, because the living conditions that we were in, you know, were so basic. And a lot of time there was um, not really a toilet, there was no showers, no running waters, that sort of thing. There was a lot of heat, of course, a lot of walking about, carrying your own bags. So it was a, quite a shock to the system. I recently lost everything and been made bankrupt. And although I don't want to talk about that side of things, because I think if things upset you, why keep talking about them? That's just silly, isn't it? It's best to just forget about it and move on, so which I have done. But at the time, I was in places where people had very little, if anything, and they all seemed really happy. And I couldn't get my head around it because I'd associated for so long to be happy, to, you know, I'd always, for years and years, I'd always thought to be happy, I've got to have lots of money, I've got to have a big flash house, I've got to have big flash cars, I've got to have shoes and clothes. And those are the things that you have to have to be happy. So that was my focus for so many years. And then I lost everything and I was a bit lost myself then. I was like, well, if I haven't got all those things, how am I, how am I supposed to be happy then? Uh, but then I, I go and I'm in rural China and they've nothing, they've no telly, no electricity, no bloody toilets and... But as long as they had their family around them, that seemed to be all that mattered. So when I came back, it did give me the chance to refocus where my priorities were, which was with my husband and trying to find things that could make us both happy that didn't involve having a lot of money and possessions. So it did refocus me, which was great. Dancing with, Star with the Stars was in its third series by the time I got on it. And I, feel, I felt sure as well that they'd put me in there thinking that I would be like a comedy aspect. Uh, especially when I saw my dance partner Stefano because he was six foot two and I was like five foot one so we were we were very unmatched there uh, and I think they put us together because they thought that we would look amusing and make people laugh and that I would obviously be useless because I was 50 odd sort of thing. I said to him, I know I won't be the best dancer, but I have a theory that if I just go out there and dance with all my heart and soul and give it everything that I've got, that the people will get behind me and they'll really want me to win because they can see that I'm very passionate about it. So Stefano and I would dance for six to eight hours every day. In fact, some days I couldn't even get my shoes on, my feet were so swollen uh, and I w from week three I was dancing with a pulled muscle, a torn ligament and a fractured rib. Uh, and in the final, in the first dance of the final, which was a chatter, my rib did break. And as a Stefano, I'd just come out, two, three, cha-cha-cha, Stefano got me, threw me backwards, he bent me down backwards, and as he pulled me back up, I felt the rib snap. It was like somebody sticking a sword right in. And I literally, I screamed out loud. Uh, but you couldn't hear because the music was so loud and pe the live audience were cheering. But Stefano knew, and as we were continuing dancing round, that huge smile he used to have, we were dancing round, he's going, are you all right, are you all right? Do you want to keep dancing, keep dancing? He was like a ventriloquist dummy. But I kept saying, keep going, keep going. Uh, but they were going to cancel the show. It was all very dramatic. The floor manager had the headphones on and he was saying, she's broken a rib, she's not coming out. We'll, you know, get the ambulance. And I kept saying, no, I've, I've got to go out. And winning that was one of the most wonderful things ever, ever, ever. Apart from marrying my husband, that has got to be the highlight of my whole life. Now, the blue monkey came about because when I used to go to discos in the 70s and the 80s, 
People used to like it when they could get up and all do the same dance. That's what I thought. I thought a lot of people are too shy to get up and dance, you know what I mean? But if like in the 70s when we were all in a line doing the same dance or whatever, people would always get up. And I thought, but if you give people a dance that everybody's doing and they can all get up and do it when they hear that song, I thought that would be the way to go. That would get people up on the dance floor. So I was trying to think of something that I could make a dance to. One night at home, I drank nearly a bottle of port and came up with the idea for the Blue Monkey, which was the name of a nightclub in Sunderland a friend of mine took me to once. Uh, so that was it. We'd got the song, we recorded it, and, uh, and it was quite funny, and there was funny film clips of my adverts, and there was a dance that people could do. Uh, and it was Get Down, Get Funky, Everybody Do the Blue Monkey. And people seemed to like it. Marcus Lush at the time, he had a TV show at the time, and he predicted that it would be number one. Uh, it wasn't quite a number one, but they did play it a lot on, on the music channel at the time. And every now and then somebody will repost it onto Facebook uh, or onto the YouTube. And since the Blue Monkey, I have actually done another music video since then, which people are always reposting on Facebook, and that was with Scribe. I did a rap. Mm, with Scribe, which was a lot of fun. I was all dressed in gold and see, I've got my wrapping. See, that's an S, you see, like this. Scribe was teaching me to do yo word. And that was all about stranger danger. He's a lolly exchanger, stranger danger. Uh, so that's another music video I've had. So that's quite a lot of fun. If it sounds like it's going to be fun and people will like it, generally I do it.